perfect perfect yeah i'm i'm also super excited uh to be here hi guys um i am going to share my screen just let me know if my screen is visible You know, we've got a good amount of people here today. People are excited for this. Yeah. Um, Webho, have you shared it yet? Because I don't think I can see that. Uh, just a second. OK, cool. Thank God. Is it visible? Yes, we can see it. All right. Um, yeah. Let me just go to presentation mode. Let me know if you guys can see the presentation mode. Completely visible. Um, wait, hold on. No, it just says click to exit full screen for me. It's, it's his screen, actually. There we go. Perfect. It's visible now? Uh, yes. Awesome. OK, uh, hi, guys. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much uh, to Learn Web3 Draw for uh, conducting this session with CapEx. Uh, we are really excited about this. Uh, we have been doing some sessions for the last uh, few months. Uh, we were doing it mostly on our Discord. Uh, we did a few spaces, AMAs, and all that. Uh, but the whole idea was, again, apart from obviously talking about the product and our offering, was to inform people, uh, basically act as some sort of an off-chain on-ramp for, uh, for in, in an educational sense for people to be able to transition from uh, from from a Web2 space to Web3 space, just to know about what, what is going on, how this technology is evolving, uh, how uh, what all scope there is to it and um, how it's going to basically progress in the near future. So this session is going to be a basic one. Uh, we aren't going to go uh, into very deep uh, understandings of how uh, layer one, layer two works and uh, how, how uh, validator nodes work and all those things. So this is going to be more of a brief um, overview of how things function in DeFi. What is DeFi? Why is it needed? Things like that. And we're going to brush on concepts like um, what is the difference between token and cryptocurrency? A lot of these terminologies are thrown around, but I guess there still is uh, probably some confusion in people who are like still entering the space. If you have been in the space for some time, you would obviously know all of these things uh, by heart by now. But uh, this is for more of people who are like transitioning or trying to get into the space. Uh, then there are consensus mechanisms that we're going to touch, which is uh, proof of work, proof of stake, and delegated proof of stake. Um, what do they mean? Why do we need those? And then there is uh, Ether, which is the token for Ethereum, the gas, what is gas? We see a lot of, uh, uh, again, news articles and media about the gas being so high, but what is it? Or why, why is it needed? And then we have uh, smart contracts and dApps. Again, all of these terminologies exist for some time now, but especially can be overwhelming for people who are like entering the space. So we're going to try to uh, explain it in as simple terms as possible. So I guess, yeah, we can uh, start. So I guess uh, one of the best ways to start these things is uh, through memes. We have been um, seeing a lot of memes in this space. And uh, I think we've all come across these memes either on Twitter on, or Reddit where uh, people are talking uh, about you know investing and not investing in crypto at the same time especially in the last uh, few months it's had, it has been a, a little rough uh, uh, considering all our portfolios um, then uh, it's it's uh, one of the memes which has been going around for some time now which is uh, which which is this one 
so this is how uh, basically anybody who is doing these sessions uh, it looks like and this is probably me on the right uh, is how i'm going to appear to most of the people who might uh, listen to this uh, and are new to the space and then uh, this is probably you by the end of it so hopefully we'll will uh, get get out of this uh, session alive so yeah let's let's uh, move on um so first of all let's just uh, focus on uh, traditional finance and everything uh, traditional finance or tradfi has which is not working for uh, for itself and when when you're talking about traditional finance we're going to be talking about banks because banks are one of those institutions which each and every one of the retail uh, people have interacted with they have been involved with bank one way or the other Uh, especially if you are above eighteen, you would definitely have had experience with dealing with banks. Um, there are three major loopholes because of which DeFi was considered and came into existence to begin with. Uh, one of them was payment and clearance system. So for the longest time, um, when it comes to international trades, and I myself have dealt with this uh, before, you know, entering into DeFi, uh, was that. i being a, a co-founder of an agency previously uh, we used to have international clients from australia from from the us and when we used to raise invoices to them there used to be huge uh, they, they, first there used to be a remittance period then there used to be some transaction fees and usually used to take anywhere between a week to two weeks for the transfer of money to actually happen and it used to be a really big hassle because both the parties used to have their cas on calls and and a lot of hassle used to happen which which uh, is one of the biggest applications of defi that irrespective of um, where you reside you will be like the barrier to entry is as good as just having an internet connection so um, that is one thing uh, the other being uh, accessibility so uh, we 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 are all aware that how a lot of these countries especially these third world countries uh, the kind of uh, financial scarcity that they face and one of the biggest up that defi has seen uh, recently is that these falling economies are able to adopt uh, bitcoin as a currency for their own nation and uh, in order to invite even business in in, in their uh, countries so uh, a very good example would be el salvador how they have adopted and i would say that it's still too soon to say that they are a successful model what they are uh, going through but still it's a very positive step if you think about how bitcoin has gone from being called a uh, funny internet money to actually being uh, used as a currency in a country so so accessibility is a huge uh, up that defi has over tradfi and then we come to centralization and transparency so this is this is a big one i believe this is something that each and every one has uh, personally seen if they were uh, anywhere active uh, back in 2008 when when the crisis happened when uh, the major recession happened when we got to see how uh, dubious uh, these uh, schemes and structures or financial uh, structured products that uh, banks have created over the years over the decades to basically not a, a, like they're so complex uh, on the surface that people don't usually even go beyond the first page to actually see what they're investing into and that is a lack of transparency that comes because of centralization is what defi solves right because uh, at, in defi it, at the end of the day it's all about open source it's all about audit reports it's all about the people being able to view the code that they are going to uh, do their transactions on so that is a huge up again uh, for defi and uh, probably one of the major reasons why people want to shift to um, uh, decentralized finance because of the lack of transparency and the immense amount of centralization in, in the current uh, financial institutions so once we move on uh, we get to what is defi uh, well in short if i was to tell you what defi is defi is essentially just uh, how a decentralized system comes together where community is taking decisions on not just how they want to spend their money but where they want to spend their money 
so th- that is i believe is a very big up for um, for 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 as a community that whatever financial product that you want to use you are able to make decisions as to um what channel you want to use uh, what exact uh, currency you want to use in which you want to make the transaction in and uh, that is the kind of freedom that decent uh, decentralized finance comes with uh, now a very good uh, question would be that um, it is the people who are taking these decisions and for the longest time we have believed that uh, uh people aren't very smart when it comes to taking their own financial decisions uh history is a very good example of how even like people uh have screwed over their own personal finances because of the lack of uh long term vision and uh, that's that's i guess uh to some degree we'll have to agree to that but at the same time i believe uh the the, the reason why decentralized finance works is because of these three things which is uh, the financial incentives uh, the blockchain technology and the decentralized decision making so if i so this is this is what this is what makes um, this is a play of game theory which is there in a decentralized finance in which the community which is taking decision for a financial product is uh, not just uh incentivized with with uh in one way or the other with with some rewards for how good decision they make but at the same time if they end up taking a bad decision or a wrong decision uh for everyone they uh their own money is at stake so the risk is of losing your own money if you take a wrong decision uh that is a very good way to especially root out all the bad actors in the system and also incentivize all the good actors uh the blockchain technology again it's blockchain technology is um thrown is a word thrown around a lot uh, we won't be getting into uh, what uh, blockchain technology is and how it works um like at a very developer level we won't be going into in that direction at least not in this session uh but the idea is that uh, blockchain uh in itself uh solves a lot of these problems because it is a combination of multiple technologies it combines cryptography it combines um, the consensus model of people voting as to what should happen uh, by using their own money and then the whole decentralized decision making is just uh, how i would say is it's just a voting power giving to the given to the people uh, which uh, again the whatever tokens that they hold or whatever the currency that they hold they can use that to make decisions instead of uh, making empty decisions now somebody who uh, has more stake or basically who has more money will be able to have more power in decision making at the same time he uh, holds more risk as to losing that part of his money so again that incentivization uh, works perfectly here uh the uh, one of the two terminologies which is uh, token versus cryptocurrency is uh, thrown around and and i think there is there is still uh, some gap between these two, two terminologies so i think we can dig a little deep as to understand why or what these two terms are a uh, token is like again token in itself it's it's a crypto asset we have heard about uh, different projects launching their token uh, in 2017 we saw an ico uh, bubble then then we saw uh, people doing ideos ios at the end of the day what it is is that uh, any project which wants to launch uh, or which basically wants to uh, wants to publicly list its own project onto the market uses its token to do so so in a way it is used as equity but at the same time uh, almost all these projects have a function attached to these tokens other than just uh, holding uh, it as equity right so uh, the reason is again it's 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 not it's a legal reason but at the same time it's also that all these projects which are working towards solving a problem are using their own token one way or the other to solve that problem 
So that's how the function of that token comes into the picture. I, I, I'll basically explain this with examples. Uh, so like we all, all, we all know Ethereum as a chain. So Ethereum uh, has its own token called Ether or ETH is what uh, all of us uh, commonly uh, use. Now ETH has a function of being used uh, in transaction to pay gas fee. This gas fee that you pay is necessary for each and every transaction that goes on chain. This is one of the ways that the network operates, right? So ETH in itself is a utility token. So it, it, is, it has a utility attached to it. Similarly, we have Curve Finance, which is a lending borrowing protocol in which uh, there are liquidity pools and people are like, putting money in those liquidity pools and, and, and earning APYs. There are people who are using these liquidity pools to borrow. Webinar um, um, uh, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. You can go on. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so yeah. So the idea of a utility token is to have a function attached to it. And as soon as there's a function attached to a token, it, it bypasses that security uh, of, of like ending up being a security token. Um, why that is important is because security is basically any asset which is used to hold on to and speculate. So any token which is used to speculate and, or purely speculate is lies on lies on the uh, side of being a security token. That makes it a bit of a legal problem uh, because securities require um, extra paperwork and extra identification as an investor. And that, that is one of the reasons uh, why most of, the most of the projects don't want to uh, come off as launching a security token in the market. So uh, all of these tokens have a utility attached to it. So although they also act as a part of uh, like equity in, in the project, that's why investors, when they're investing a huge sums of money, capital into projects, uh, they are allocated certain tokens. So 100% it does act as equity. There's no denying that, but it is not uh, your normal speculative equity because now it also has function attached to it. So it is either used as a utility token, at times it is a governance token. A very good example would be Uniswap because Uniswap has something called Uni token, uh, which is a platform token, but at the same time it is a governance token. So it has a utility attached to it, but it also uh, has, uh, it is also used as a governance token. A governance token is um, same as what we discussed earlier, where people are using a token to vote for anything that they, any proposal that they want to go through, or they're voting against any proposal that they want to, um, that they don't want it to go through. So that is what a governance token is. Uh, MakerDAO has its own governance token, MKR. Um, I think uh, all of you might be aware of that. And then there's something called a transaction token. Bitcoin is uh, probably the best example when it comes to a uh, transaction token. Transactional token is uh, with the function of only used for transactions, which is transfer of value. And uh, that is essentially what a cryptocurrency is. I feel uh, the word cryptocurrency is like a subset where uh, it is a crypto token, which is used as a currency. So any token which is used as a currency or which uh, intends to only be used as a currency can be labeled as uh, cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is probably one of the best examples. Um, so yeah, this is this is essentially the difference between token and cryptocurrency. And uh, these these are some of the very good examples of a utility token, which is Uni, ETH, CRV, AVAX for Avalanche. So uh, ETH and AVAX are uh, both uh, tokens of their own chains. So we have Avalanche chain, which uh, has its own token AVAX and Ethereum chain, which has its own token Ether, ETH, uh, as commonly known. So 
then we move on to consensus models uh, i hope everybody is clear on what is a token what is a cryptocurrency um, the proof of stake proof of work and delegated proof of stake these are three consensus models which usually all blockchains use um very commonly like how we all started with was proof of work i think um, this dates back to when the bitcoin white paper came back in 2008 and uh, it was stated that how the chain is going to work with the function of mining more bitcoin which is going to be used as a um, as accrual of value over uh, the next over over the years with a limited supply and and all of those things that come with the token right uh, all the tokenomics attached to it having a maximum supply having uh, having being uh, inflationary or deflationary and all of those things but the idea of the chain and and the mechanism of uh, uh, of reaching a consensus was proof of work now what proof of work is exactly so this can be explained uh, very easily with um, an example of let's say there are 10 people and in in this model uh, there is a block which has a list of transactions right which needs to be which which needs to go on to the chain so once this block is formed and it needs to go on to the chain there are these 10 people who need to all agree that this block and and the transactions that there that there are in the block are true if for if everyone agrees for them to be true that is when the block becomes a part of the chain um now this uh, in order for this block to go on chain uh, there are set of computational uh, there set of puzzles that everyone needs to solve um once the, the person who solves all all the puzzles the first uh, gets the chance to basically upload the or or uh, approve the block so this is what proof of work is essentially in which everyone is incentivized with some rewards in order to solve the puzzle faster um a very good again a very good example would be um again this is this is a, a meme so do not take everything on its uh, face value but it's a very good meme where people are comparing with a uh, bitcoin with ethereum again it's not all true but the idea is that bitcoin is more uh, superior and better ethereum is uh, not as good as bitcoin and all those things but uh, again uh, the, the idea being that uh, proof of work which uh, uses uh, something called a uh, like which uses a lot of hardware and computational power in order to approve a single block onto the chain and then there is proof of stake which uses uh, what we call staking some amount of money onto uh, like staking some amount of money in order for you to increase your probability to approve a block so if if i was to explain this with an example a very good example would be that in a proof of stake is basically there are 10 people who are instead of using computational power they are using whatever money they have in their pockets and the person who has maximum money in his pocket gets the chance to approve a block uh, the difference between one of the difference between proof of work and proof of stake is that proof of work has miners and proof of stake has validators uh, it's a change in um, terminology but it also means that validators are people who are validating these blocks in order for them to become part of the chain uh, the incentivization or how game theory comes into the picture is that if a validator is uh, doesn't um, approves a block which is not valid and is not agreed upon by the others he or she loses whatever stake they had logged uh, and and that is how they are incentivized to take the right decision like we discussed uh, for the uh, for for the good of the whole uh, of all the participants in the system so that is uh, how these two things work a uh, very good um, another uh, good difference between these two would be that if somebody was to hack proof of work chain uh, they would have had to 
they would have had to uh, use a computational power which is more than 51% or 51% or more computational power than the entire system which is again uh, practically impossible and then if uh, there was proof of stake model in that uh, somebody would need to have uh, more capital than 51% of the network which again becomes practically Im impossible for somebody to do it um these things are the reasons why we say that it is impossible to hack a blockchain or at least theoretically impossible to hack a blockchain or or change the data on a blockchain because in order to do so you will have to bypass these consensus models and you will have to have either huge amounts of capital or huge amounts of computational power uh in order to uh in order to crack uh, sorry in order to basically make a decision and go against what everyone else agrees on so this is um, a a very basic difference between proof of stake and proof of work and uh, one of the up that proof of stake had was a delegated proof of stake now let's get back to why do we need proof of stake um, when we already had proof of work and why do we need delegated proof of stake when we had proof of stake so proof of work one of the disadvantages of proof of work was that it used to uh, use a lot of computational power and uh, it's like when 10 people are running their systems and uh, they are they're consuming huge amounts of power uh, all 10 of them are using that power and only one system or one node what we uh, call a node gets approved uh, or or basically gets selected because it does the computation the fastest in to approve the block so what happens is that the nine other systems who were also working uh, all the power that was consumed in the nine other systems gets wasted so this was a very inefficient way um, it it is still uh, from a consensus mechanism it's a very uh, it's one of the best consensus mechanisms that we have but at the same time it is very inefficient at the same time the second thing being that there was a lot of pooling of uh, different miners which used to come together and combine their computational power in order to solve the puzzles faster now what happens is that uh, when when a lot of miners or major miners are coming together to solve these uh, uh, to to combine their computational power and solve these puzzles there is a centralization which is happening here so in order to bypass these two problems that proof of work had proof of stake came into picture they said that instead of computational power we are going to use stake staking mechanism in which all these different validators are going to put their own money they're going to lock their own money for uh, and on onto the chain and whoever has more money gets uh, gets a higher probability of approving the next block so this pretty much solves both the problems that proof of work had which it is more cost efficient it is more energy efficient but the problem that proof of stake has uh, is that it basically favors anybody who has more capital with them again this is a this is something which goes again the against the ethos of uh, decentralization in which the people who have more capital again end up making the decisions for everyone so this is the reason why delegated proof of stake came into the picture so if i was to uh, explain delegated proof of stake um it's it's pretty um, it is it is pretty simple as to that it is exactly like proof of stake but uh, there are certain changes that have been made in which the people have been giving given more power in delegated proof of stake so the people who are participating in the network they are given the right to vote or uh, basically stake for the people who are going to validate the node so for example there are 10 people and then there are hundreds of people who are participating in the network so these hundreds of people put their own money and they are like i will vote for this person this this um, i i delegate my stake to this validator node because i believe that he or she is going to make the right decision 
so there are hundreds of people putting their own money at stake or delegating their stake to a particular set of delegators so this is how more decentralization is achieved in which these people who are using their own money in order to put their trust in a particular person are able to uh, achieve more decentralization at the same time the persons who are uh, the, the the nodes essentially who are uh, going to finally participate in the uh, validation process instead of using their own capital they're getting capital from the people itself the participants of the network so everybody gets more involved in the decision making process so let's say now these 10 people who have been voted upon and have been given certain amount of capital by the people are now participating and now the network chooses one delegate uh, one delegator which has the maximum amount of stake so that basically means that more people have chosen or uh, has chosen that uh, particular node in order to approve the transaction and that particular person gets to approve the transaction at the end of the day so this is this is essentially the difference uh, or the major, the major difference between delegated proof of stake and proof of stake um i guess uh bef- before we move forward i would like to um, i would like hardik uh, or or anyone i think uh, matsal is there anyone who would want to like open the floor to some questions uh if uh, there are any questions before we move forward because we are almost towards the end of uh, our presentation and uh, would like to know like uh, what questions anyone has uh, for for whatever we had discussed until now absolutely um yeah we've been <laughs> the chat has been going crazy around consensus algorithms and dao voting and governance so oh, awesome. um, <clears throat> if anybody wants to like raise their hand and ask questions if you just click the raise hand button i can unmute you um, or i guess you can still unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask a question in the mean mm, there we go ahmed um go for it okay uh, thank you very much um i have a question regarding uh delegated proof of stake so um i recently learned like dive deeper into daos and um you know creating a dao using open zeppelin and um it's kind of relating to you know voting and uh, making decisions based on how much token you can stake or how much power you have based on how much token you have so um i'm trying to like know how daos are related to delegated proof of stakes you know in delegated proof of stake you can also choose who you validate or you want to mine so right. for DAOs, you can also do things like, uh, you know, voting or making a proposal. So I want to know if delegated proof of stake is built upon DAOs or how deviated they are, because I can see some similarities. All right. <clears throat> so I guess um, one of the uh, differences between, um, uh, again, from what I understood was that your question is between uh how is delegated proof of stake or what 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 is what um uh, what are the parallels between a dao taking collective decision and a delegated proof of stake if i'm not wrong yeah you are right yes right so um delegated proof of stake is a consensus mechanism which is there for a blockchain and dao is more of an organizational play so um i would probably create a line between uh, uh, t- uh, like blockchain being a technology and all of these nodes uh, making like o- all of these validators or delegators in, in with res- if you are talking about delegated proof of stake being uh, systems which are uh, which are basically being voted upon uh, being staked upon and who are at the end of the day uh, approving a block for it to go onto the blockchain whereas i think dao becomes more of uh, taking a decision of whether a uh, chain should adapt proof of stake or delegated proof of stake so it's a layer above uh, 
the the whole consensus mechanism of a blockchain so for example um, a very good example would be now now dows the whole idea why dows came into the picture to begin with was to bring more decentralization to the organization right that any any project would want to eventually become fully decentralized uh, becoming fully decentralized has its own pros and cons but uh, the whole idea is for the people to take collective decisions on whether they want a certain uh, person being elected uh, taking their uh, decisions for their tech certain person being elected to take decisions for uh, hiring decisions or uh, funding decisions or even what chain they want to deploy deploy their product on and if it is the chain which has its own dao for example if ethereum has ethereum foundation then it is um, it is it is the people taking decisions as to what proposal goes through what proposal doesn't go through so it is somewhat not exactly the decision making which comes into the picture with uh, the the uh, transaction uh, the block of transactions going on chain but more about uh, what decisions need to be taken when it comes to the functioning of of the organization itself now there could very well be uh, uh, some uh, places where the uh, a transactional block which has gone on chain has some problems with it or has some tampering with it where the decision is being opened to the dao itself to make a decision whether they want to do a soft fork a hard fork or things like that which are obviously rare but we saw something similar happen with um, with uh, actually one of the very controversial ones was again this is not related to the chain thing but it it happened with juno on cosmos and then recently we saw terra also uh, uh, taking decisions in which uh, the community was voting and taking decisions as to how they want to go forward although that was a uh, far more centralized system and um, but but yeah i think i hope that answers your question okay yeah it answered my question but it it gave rise to a different question okay thank you very right. much so um, yeah. i understand that dows you you get to yeah. make a proposal based on right. your voting power based on how much token you possess but right. how are delegates chosen like are they are they chosen like do we validators are chosen or like is there something else like our delegator okay so um this is chosen. also the, yeah so this is also like um a question which is very personal to what what exact chain are we talking about because different chains when implementing their consensus models have slight uh, tweaked the systems that they go forward with um by definition a delegated proof of stake is that when uh, people are voting as to to whom they want to delegate their stake to so for example um if uh, somebody has $1000 they're choosing between a b and c as to which person they want to stake their $1000 to now between a b and c whichever uh, now uh, again as i said that different chains have different models in some chains it is random in which there is a algorithm which chooses randomly a delegator and then there are chains which uses the delegator again with the maximum amount of stake itself so these delegated uh, these delegators are chosen based on what what chain we are referring to and um, again it it could be a, a random function which chooses a delegator and that delegator basically approves uh, a, a block and whatever the transaction fee is that is getting uh, divided among the people all the people who staked uh, or delegated their stake to that particular delegator and at the same time it could be just that the maximum uh, amount of stake that a delegator has uh, that gets chosen by the uh, by the chain and uh, approves the block further all right thank you very much i i i hope that helps ah yeah it it did it did a lot thanks perfect perfect thank you amazing um if anybody else has any questions feel free to raise your hand and ask in the meantime web of i just want to get your thoughts on since yeah. you mentioned terra now <laughs> everything <laughs> that's happening with terra 3ac celsius block fire everything where do you see sort of 
um, this space going? I know they weren't like true DeFi, I guess, but where do you see sort of the challenges and how it has affected the space um, in a broader way? Yeah, I, I, I guess um, one of the uh, major, uh, like I think everything trickled down from when the whole uh, UST DPEG happened, when, when the uh, Terra crash happened, uh, Luna crash happened, sorry. Um, it, 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 that was, I guess, the trigger uh, to, to everything that we have been seeing for the last three months. Um, I feel like one of the major problems that uh, this uh, space has, and I, I won't really call it a problem, it's more of a challenge. And uh, at the end of the day, I think we are going to evolve um, as, as we move forward is that uh, the space is still not mature enough to, uh, or, or at least the markets aren't efficient enough to make these uh, decisions of how the capital needs to be um, needs to be deployed and where the capital needs to be deployed. So we saw one of the biggest problems that Three um, AC had uh, was that they were taking uh, they had huge leveraged positions uh, with the money that they had borrowed, and um, considering that we are still in the nascent uh, stages of crypto markets. And as, as we can see the huge volatility in the, in the, in the prices of tokens, uh, taking huge leverage positions, uh, especially on borrowed money um, or on uh, over uh, or, or, or under collateralized, uh, or in fact, the, some of the loans didn't even had collateralization. Nobody knows what were actually the, uh, the, the terms and conditions of the loans that they had taken. Um, but taking such decisions with other people's money is something which needs to change. And I believe as we move forward in this space as, as uh, more, um, I, I'm not sure how, how to put this, but I guess as uh, more mature capital flows in, uh, we would be taking much more efficient decisions. So I think at the end of the day, it becomes a problem with uh, how much uh, power these centralized um, funds and and uh, projects uh, have, and how well or how badly they use that power that they get with this capital. So th that that is something that uh, these these uh, financial decisions that they're making with others' money needs to change overall. Uh, these things aren't that common in in, uh, in in traditional finance. The reason being that uh, there are a lot of parties uh, watching these uh, these these uh, financial decisions that the uh, that the funds are taking. But since uh, we we have these <clears throat> we have these transactions happening in um, un under under the table soft deals in OTCs. Uh, in 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 in, uh, in in pools where nobody knows like uh, where the money is flowing uh, in and from, uh, that becomes uh, that that creates a huge amount of fud among the retail. That that creates a huge uh, amount of lack of confidence between people. Once even a small, you know, we we see one project falling and suddenly the whole community, uh, or or in fact institutions as well. Uh, try to you know uh, take take their uh, financial immediate financial gains from it uh, instead of uh, you know b basically taking it through and and having a longer term vision. So I guess that is something which which uh, we'll see uh, things evolve. We'll we'll see these funds and these projects take more better and more uh, I, I would say long term uh, vision decisions. Uh, that that should definitely change, uh, or at least prevent or mitigate such such disasters in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I cannot wait until things like that happen. It sounds like, in retrospect, it seems so stupid. Everything that happened with three AC, you know, but yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. yeah, more mature capital. We need people. We need tools. Well. I honestly don't even want to blame the people who lost their money in that stuff because 100%, like, yeah. so much jargon and so 
hard to understand if you're not like technically savvy. Um, right. So yeah, I we, def we definitely need uh, more, more, um, more of like, um, as you said, uh, as you mentioned, like tools which which give you more of an oversight, and at the same time, some amount of foresight as to how, uh, like how the capital is being managed and uh, where it is being flown to. I think uh, that kind of information will help not just institutions, but also retail take better decisions on, with their capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mean Zushu is still going to be buying $50 million yachts? <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least, yeah, if, if we at least know about it, we, we, we would be like uh, taking better decisions. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> amazing amazing um another thing is somebody asked this question actually i don't know if you want to wrap up the presentation first uh there's just a couple more questions i wanted to pick up from chat otherwise sure 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 we can address the questions Oops. okay um there were there was one question earlier in chat and they were asking about as a beginner um how do you sort of find trustworthy DeFi apps or like how do you start getting involved in the ecosystem really I think is what they were trying to ask because they're like as a beginner I was scammed on discord before and how do you like make sure you're what you're interacting with is kind of like legit and true DeFi I guess right right <clears throat> um I believe uh like even after like e even after um uh, some degree of transparency we we are seeing a lot of projects uh, failing um, or at least not a, not being able to deliver on on the said milestones and uh, in some cases it's genuine just like how it is genuine in uh, how a startup raises money from tiger global and sequoia and is not able to you know go to an ipo a lot of projects fail uh, that that is somewhat similar even in web3 uh, only the other day, I was reading this uh, article which says the 92% of uh, crypto projects fail. Uh, it's by Imbu, and and uh, it states the uh, the different reasons why the projects are failing. 100% uh, there is 80% 81% of the projects which are scams, and uh, these these projects are abandoning uh, the the communities. These projects are. Uh, uh, taking away uh, whatever the money that they're raising, uh, but then out of out of that, even there are fifteen to sixteen percent of projects which are just not able to deliver, or uh, for whatever X Y Z reasons, bad hires, uh, in inefficient uh, systems in place, or or basically not able to uh, find better ways to deploy their capital, or whatever X Y Z reason could be. Um, I think. One of the ways that anybody can identify a red flag or at least uh, not use a product or invest uh, money into a token is by checking if, um, like, again, there, there is a part which is like uh, social proof, uh, seeing who has invested in, the, in, in that project, the website, LinkedIn, uh, going after the team, uh, going after the audit reports and documentation, all of those things. But at the same time, one of the uh, very good ways would be uh, to, th there are certain markers that you can check and only after once those markers are, uh, you know, you, you see them being fulfilled, you should be, you know, you, you can feel a more secure uh, about using a product or investing into a token. Uh, one of them being um, the total value logged so usually the applications which has more value logged are more reliable. Um, so you can always go and check what is the total value logged in an, in an application. Uh, the other one being that you can always go to coin market cap. If you are investing in a token, you can always go and look at what is the uh, maximum supply, total supply and the circulating supply. A lot of these tokens uh, that we see are very promising only because of the uh, price at which they launch. So a lot of tokens are launching at 0.1 uh, dollars. They have a total supply of uh, one trillion dollars, and currently circulating supply would be somewhat one percent or maybe 0.1 percent. 
the, the, the problem with that is that uh, once you evaluate and and once you uh, basically it's it's a simple math in which you multiply whatever the current token price is with the total uh, token supply which gives you the fully diluted value of that token so what these fdvs with even 1% supply circulating supply have uh, are, are valued at at times 1 billion dollars whereas it was launched uh, a month back so that, that is a very good marker of uh, evaluating before uh, basically investing in any even if you want to invest in a shit coin that's a personal retail decision uh, irrespective of that whatever token you invest in these are the markers you can always go and check other than this uh, again on the product side look for tvl look for uh, what kind of conversations are going around that product on reddit uh, again a good a good place to be if you are not seeing uh, a lot of active threads or people talking about a product on reddit or any other forum it would probably like again that's that's uh, i won't say that's a red flag but that is something you can probably reconsider before using uh, a product so conversations on reddit uh, a good a good tokenomics model that you can check uh, by by literally seeing three numbers on on coin market cap would give you a good overview of um, how well the project is adjusted and this is obviously other than the due diligence that you would do uh looking into the team looking into their website socials uh their documentation white paper whatever absolutely yeah it's it's um yeah i think one of the things beginner really get wrong is the idea about unit price so what you mentioned there about market cap and total supply um Correct. i think that's like a very very common mistake i see with beginners right they're like Oh, ETH is a thousand dollars and Cardano is fifty cents. So obviously, Cardano is going to be. <laughs> uh, but yeah. actually, Cardano's market cap is like huge. Um, this is simply depends on total supply and number of tokens, right? Unit price is not always what makes sense. Hundred um, percent. Yeah. Nice tip for anyone thinking about doing crypto investments. Anyway. Um, I think we're limited to like the meeting will run but the recording of the meeting I think we're limited to an hour um I don't know if I can restart it after that so maybe we want to finish over the presentation as we only have a few minutes left and then do the rest of sure. the today yeah 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 perfect so back to uh, the presentation we have a couple of a uh, few slides left uh we we we'll just go through what Uh, Ethereum is what Ether is and what gas fee uh, means. So Ethereum, as it says on Ethereum dot org itself, is that it is the world's programmable blockchain. So Ethereum is something which brought smart contracts into the picture. It is uh, one of the first blockchains which uh, made possible the use of uh, these customizable um, these customizable codes, which. any project can use and deploy on the ethereum blockchain so this was one of the very big ups that ethereum had over bitcoin that bitcoin as a chain didn't have any other functionality rather than uh, rather than mining bitcoin and uh, doing transactions with it um, or or more like uh, basically mining bitcoin and using it as a currency but whereas ethereum was uh, ethereum is more like it's it's programmable The, what it means by programmable blockchain is that it's a chain which introduced us with token standards like ERC20 ERC721 it's a chain which introduced us to the concept of smart contract which we are going to get into in the next couple of slides um, now what gas fee is a uh, gas fee is basically a small fee that the network the ethereum network which is the ethereum blockchain it's the same thing uh, it charges when ever you make a uh, whenever you do a transaction on the chain itself so whenever you are transferring assets whenever you are exchanging uh, assets whether it's nft whether it is a token you are uh, you are charged a small fee which is called gas fee this gas fee itself is paid in ethereum um if any one of you has um, i'm sure you would have uh, used polygon uh, the token the token matic is used whenever you are making transactions on that chain so what uh, the the 
the the ether which is eth uh, for ethereum is the same what matic is for polygon so it is a utility token which is used to pay gas fee and uh, whenever you are uh, using the network uh, and uh, uh, it it started with uh, being a small fee but uh, recently uh, the, the last year or so we have seen the fee increase and that is one of the very uh, big reasons why we want to make the shift from ethereum to ethereum 2.0 uh again ethereum 2.0 is a discussion for some other time but we would definitely would want to get into that as well uh probably in the next session and um, yeah so that that is what a ga gas fee is and uh, this this fee uh, is basically there on every chain solana has it avalanche has it near has it uh it's just that all of these other chains have different consensus models and therefore they have much better uh, or or much lesser fee uh on on their own chains whereas ethereum we have seen a huge increase in this fee that they charge uh, which is called gas fee and then ether is basically their token eth that we all know um it is used to pay gas and it's a utility token then getting to smart contracts and dapps again a quick overview would be that a smart contract is a set uh, how basically i have understood it and how i would want everybody to understand it is that it's a it's 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 essentially an if else statement if anybody has done any bit of coding of c c++ uh even back in school they would understand what an if else statement is uh, it essentially means that if something is true you have to perform certain set of instructions else you have to perform another set of instructions this is obviously an oversimplification of what a smart contract is uh but a smart contract is essentially um it it has a set of instructions and it has a certain set of conditions if those conditions are met those certain set of instructions are executed um this is um again so smart contracts have their own language in which they are coded uh won't get into too much of the different coding languages like solidity rust and all that because that becomes a bit more complicated especially for this session uh but that is what a smart contract is it's a uh, it's a set of code uh, it's it's a set of uh, lines of code which uh, basically automatically performs uh, instructions when certain conditions are met um now dapp is a decentralized application it's an application which is uh, which might have a single or multiple smart contracts within it so a good example of dapp would be like uniswap that we were talking about curve finance bank or balancer all of these are different dapps right so these dapps are basically deployed on blockchains so ethereum being a blockchain and uniswap being a decentralized exchange it's a dapp which is deployed on ethereum so that is a basic uh, like terminology and and how these things work together and uh, that is pretty much it like this is basically an overview of uh, if we do a, another session like the things that we can cover and um, i guess yeah uh, hardik we are pretty much uh, um, at the end of our presentation so we can do some more q and a before we wrap this amazing perfect 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 um great guys if anybody has any questions again um just feel free to raise your hand and unmute and we can go from there otherwise i'll try to find something in the chat somebody has been asking something um but yeah if anybody in the audience has any questions just feel free to unmute and ask ahead right now okay. summer um go for it Uh, what will happen to block rewards once the merge takes place will they get disappear completely um so uh, <clears throat> again uh, probably we'll have to dig deep into the documentation uh, for ethereum 2.0 but uh, these block rewards uh, in proof of work we have block rewards in proof of stake we have these transaction fee so probably uh, it it is a pos model so whichever uh, node has or whichever validator node has the maximum amount of uh, 
ETH staked onto the Ethereum chain would be selected and uh, whenever the transaction goes through, the block of transaction becomes part of the blockchain. We would have that transaction fee um, as as act as rewards for that particular validated mode. If I can just quickly add on to that, yeah, uh, I don't think in, in after the merge and after everything that's happening, um, block rewards will still be present for the validators who propose the blocks. Um, so I don't think they're going away. The fees will still obviously be there and everything, but rewards aren't going anywhere. It just shifts from the miner getting the reward to the validator getting the reward who proposes the block. OK, OK, understood. Thanks. You can... No problem. Um, sorry, I just, <laughs> I've just i recently just been writing ETH to related content for Learn Web 3 now, so I'm kind of caught up on this stuff. No, no, awesome. No, no absolutely. Yeah. I, I haven't been like, uh, I, I've just read like uh, uh, an overview of what ETH 2.0 does uh, better than like ETH and what, what the transition is going to be. But yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I'm definitely yeah, uh, not that well versed. Perfect, perfect. Cool. Um, anybody else has any questions, feel free to unmute and just ask. Um, other than that, I'm still looking at the chat to find anything. A lot of people talking about price. Um, Xtreme asked earlier, although it was more of a comment, I guess, um, but I don't know how to feel about hybrid, um, collateralized, and algorithmic stable coins. I don't even have any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, so um, uh, hybrid, uh, I think this was um, last year, Iron Finance which did uh, like a hybrid um, uh, algorithmic stable coin. <clears throat> it actually didn't pretty, like it didn't go uh, very well for them. Uh, but um, again, hybrid uh, st stable coins uh, or hi hybrid stable coins have the same problem. It's just that you are adding more, uh, you're adding some collateral to it as well. Uh, but the biggest problem which uh, Luna had with UST um, uh, and, and, and the, any any other uh, future uh, hybrid or a complete algorithmic stablecoin would have is the problem that you are basically uh, creating actual wealth out of notional wealth. So when you say that you can burn one Luna and uh, create let's say one Luna is for $10 and you can create 10 USD out of it. You are essentially saying that that uh, one Luna, which is no, which, which has a notional wealth of $10 uh, suddenly becomes actual wealth in USD. So that is the underlying problem with uh, any stable coin, which, uh, it, which is algorithmic in, um, in either hybrid or complete. Uh, hybrid does mitigate the risks since now you are collateralized, but at the same time, um, at, at the same time, I don't think we completely get rid of the risks uh, with that. Uh, the, 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 we, we have to understand that uh, when, when we are saying that uh, one Luna becomes a certain amount of UST, it is uh, we are saying that let's say there are uh, 1000 uh, luna um, 1000 luna in the system which are circulating and uh, each has 10 dollars so that means there are 10000 usd in the system which is not true right that that is similar to us saying that elon musk is worth 200 uh, billion dollars but that is not true if he starts selling his uh, shares in, uh, in in tesla at this point of time and um, by the end of it, he would probably would have crashed Tesla as well as his own net worth. He would probably get less than a hundred billion, maybe less than fifty billion dollars out of it. <laughs> so the, the, that is that is the reason why notional wealth is not equal to actual wealth, uh, because it it is it hasn't been materialized or at least it hasn't been uh, it hasn't come into the system as of yet. So that is the very underlying foundational problem with algorithmic stable coins. Mm -hmm. That's that's a great answer. I feel like every every time there's a DeFi cycle, there's two projects that always come up and always fail. The one is like uncollateralized or under collateralized 
lending based stable coins or whatever there's like right. so many horror stories right like luna usd is far from the first one to do that and um the second one is always like reputation based under collateralized lending where reputation is bored from social media it should like bit cloud <laughs> Um, right. Both of these right. come every cycle and they never work. Be aware of any projects that try to advertise this to you. They have not solved this, I bet you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they haven't. I mean, algorithmic stablecoin in itself, it's a beautiful concept, uh, 100%. But again, it doesn't work. That's, uh, that's just how, like, that's just not how uh, economics works. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, over collateralized algorithmic like may still work, like things like Fave, 100%. I guess. Fair, uh, fair. Like Fave seems to work okay, but yeah, under collateralized or uncollateralized entirely, or it's just like magic internet money with Luna and UST. It's just 100%. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Not happening. Agreed. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, confused Crypto Bavar is asking, do you have any thoughts on CBDCs? Um. CBDC, I think it's it's that um, central bank digital currency, correct? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm, again, I uh, my thoughts would just be that uh, probably like don't uh, buy into it. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's it's uh, it's 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 the government introducing its own. Uh, whatever form of digital currency that they, that they are uh, calling it. Uh, but uh, again, like I, I am not very aware of uh, the the te technical side of it. But at the end of the day, it's it's not going to be decentralized. So why would you want to like, you know, that's uh, wh why would you want to buy into something which is uh, centralized, like better, you better like, uh, buy gold from it instead of like buying CBDC. Like, what's even the point? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Amazing, guys. Um, I know we're, we're about 10 minutes over time. So I'm going to give, if anybody has any more questions, maybe we'll take one or two more if anybody has anything. Otherwise, let's try to wrap this up. Um, but Thank you. Thank you so much, Vaibhav. Thank you so much, CapEx team. Um, Paki as well. I think she's still here. Thank you so much for doing this. And we had a lot of people come in, everybody in chat. I don't know if you're following chat because you were presenting, but everybody in chat loved it. Um, a lot of people thanking you for the session. And everybody's super excited for the next one as well. Hey, Hardik. Awesome. Absolutely loved it. And the chat is actually going crazy. So yeah, good job here. <laughs> thanks thanks Hardik. thanks uh thanks guys thank you so much um this was this was actually very fun honestly <laughs> uh, looking forward to more of these amazing happy happy to have you um great um i don't think there's any more questions for now i guess then um i guess we shall see you all so next weekend same time next saturday same time i believe um you see d5 part two uh, workshop part two you can see it on the screen right now the topics we're gonna cover um so get hyped uh, we're gonna do this we'll be back again and anybody who joined late or missed part of this this meeting is recorded i will be posting the recording on the discord server shortly um as soon as i can process the video and everything um and other than that again everybody say thank you to the capex team and great we shall see awesome soon. awesome yeah. just just uh, one more point Hadik. um yeah. if uh, we can like um, if you can just send across the chat uh like download the chat and send it across if that is possible we would like love to uh, address some points in the next session also okay i am gonna have to see if that's possible um sure. hmm. maybe i just yeah. copy paste this whole thing yeah, it's going to be kind of terrible, but okay, um, we'll see if that's possible and... Anything that works, yeah, not, not a problem. Uh, or Paki, you can just uh, take some screenshots of uh, the chat. Itself. Yeah, yeah, I think it will, it's going to be there on the recording and uh, the whole session's recorded, so we'll be able to take it. Okay, I, I shall make sure before I hop off the meeting, um, I shall check out the recording and see if it's there or not. Perfect.
Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. No problem. Right. We had a couple of people raise hands, but I think that was by accident. I think they were just trying to clap. Um, but, <laughs> um, great. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Vibhav. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now. And yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you.